Nuclear imaging is used for a variety of relatively minor applications in abdominal imaging. But the most uh, complicated and the one I'm going to spend the most time talking about is hepatobiliary or hide imaging. And I'll talk about the two main indications for this, acute cholecystitis and gallbladder ejection fraction. We do hide imaging using one of two tracers. They're essentially interchangeable. These traces are taken up by the liver, they're excreted in the bile, and they flow passively wherever bile is going. And that's the basis for imaging. The old application of this for acute cholecystitis is probably not of a huge importance today, but it is important to understand how it works. The approach here is that if we see the gallbladder, then we've proven patency of the cystic duct and we assume that there is no acute cholecystitis. So this is really a test of cystic duct patency. That's straightforward. If the gallbladder doesn't fill, it's more complicated. Maybe it's because there is acute cholecystitis, but maybe the gallbladder just didn't fill because of the vagaries of bile flow. That's a complicated scenario. This is physiologically configured imaging. So you got to have liver function to extract and excrete the tracer. But more importantly, bile has got to be flowing into the gallbladder at the time of imaging, or else you're not going to see it, regardless of whether it's normal or not. So a normal gallbladder that's filled already may not further fill with bile and with tracer. And this would happen in the overly distended scenario from a prolonged fast. In theory, if the patient has just eaten, the gallbladder might be contracting. We know a lot less about that, but we do try to control the fasting status. And ideally, the patient should be fasting for at least about four hours, but not more than 24 hours prior to study. Now, this often is a problem because the patient may well be NPO. So what do you do if there's a prolonged fast? You're probably going to have to do something to induce the gallbladder to contract. So the first thing that you can do is you can, before you even start the HIDA study, you can pre-treat with syncolide to induce gallbladder contraction. As the gallbladder then starts to refill, hopefully we'll see it filling with tracer. The other thing you can do is later on in the study, you can give morphine if you want. And morphine does induce gallbladder contraction, uh, filling, excuse me, as we'll talk about. You can do both of these. You can do one or the other. You can do both. Hello, my name is Claude Serlin, and I am a radiologist at UC San Diego. It is my pleasure to present this uh, lecture on the liver. I'll be focusing on an algorithmic approach for differential diagnosis of focal liver disease. My disclosures are shown on this slide. The objectives of my talk are to review certain diagnostic sets. Each of these diagnostic sets will focus on arterial phase hyperenhancement, or I should say the analysis of arterial phase hyperenhancement, APHE, or AFI. And so for the rest of this lecture, if I say AFI, I am referring, of course, to arterial phase hyperenhancement. Now, in terms of the diagnostic sets we'll review, we'll review diffuse AFI, mosaic AFI, RIM AFI, RIM AFI with peripheral washout, and peripheral discontinuous AFI. Now, just a disclosure, the first diagnostic set, diffuse AFI, is by far the longest. So please be patient with me as I go through that very long diagnostic set. The four that follow will be much shorter. Now, with each one of these diagnostic sets, we will always ask ourselves three key questions. Key question number one, does the patient have cirrhosis? Key question number two, does the patient have cirrhosis? And let's see if you can guess what key question number three is does the patient have cirrhosis? Now, the reason that this is such a key question is that the differential diagnosis of liver lesions depends very much on whether someone has cirrhosis or not. Now, shown here are some of the more common malignancies that can be seen in the liver. And shown here are some of the benign or dysplastic lesions that can be seen in the liver, 
as well as some things that are not tumors, uh, including cysts and abscesses. And if we ask ourselves, how does the frequency or the probability of these change with the presence or absence of cirrhosis, the answer is dramatically. In patients with cirrhosis, some of these things become very common and other things become uncommon. By contradistinction, in patients without cirrhosis, different things become very common while other things become very uncommon. So knowing whether someone has cirrhosis or not very much affects the pretest probability of what lesion they have, which of course then affects the post-test probability. So for the next 20 minutes, we're going to discuss imaging of the adrenal glands. Before we can decide what's abnormal about the adrenal glands, we have to think about what is normal for the adrenal glands. Uh, the normal adrenal gland usually has an apex that is less than or equal to eight millimeters in width. And each limb should be more slender than the body of the adrenal glands. So each limb should be less than or equal to seven millimeters each. Adrenal hyperplasia is associated with um, three different sort of entities. Um, there's con syndrome, which is hyperaldosteronism, but it, it more frequently due to an adenoma as opposed to hyperplasia. Cushing syndrome um, is a manifestation of hypercortisolism, which is distinct and different from Cushing disease, which refers to the presence of Cushing syndrome due to a pituitary adenoma. So in the setting of abnormal function, any mass is presumed to be the etiology of the um, adrenal hormone abnormality. So abnormal function in the setting of a mass is typically going to require some sort of surgical management with possible confirmation with adrenal vein sampling. Alternatively, if you only see hyperplasia in the setting of abnormal function, then those patients are more likely to undergo medical management. Hyperplasia of the adrenal glands is typically bilateral, and the adrenal glands typically retain their overall same morphology and shape, but can appear a little bit more nodular in this setting. The limbs are going to be typically greater than 10 millimeters wide each before you start calling adrenal hyperplasia. So let's move on to the bane of our existence, the incidental adrenal lesion. And the reason this is a problem is because there's a fair number of adults that have incidental adrenal lesions. It's been estimated about 5% of adults have adrenal, incidental adrenal lesions. But what's important here is getting an appropriate patient history. 90% of these incidental adrenal lesions will be benign if the patient has no known history of malignancy. But you'll notice the statistics change quite a bit if the patient has a known malignancy, meaning that 50 to 75% of those detected incidental adrenal lesions are actually going to be malignant in those patients. So it becomes very, very critical to know the patient background, the patient history, whenever you encounter a new adrenal lesion. Now, just like many other incidental lesions, there's been some published um, flow charts and diagrams about how the how to appropriately manage, and if needed, work these things up. In 2010, um, this flowchart was published in the Journal of the American College of Radiology as sort of a consensus document to kind of give, provide some degree of guidance for the management of incidentally detected adrenal lesions. Um, and it really only applies to those lesions that are greater than or equal to one centimeter. This is a little complicated. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the key things are dependent upon size as well as imaging features. Now, this document was then subsequently revised, and a new version of it was published in 2017. And I actually like this one a little bit better. It's a little bit cleaner than the prior, um, than the prior flow chart that was published um, seven years prior. You'll notice that we still have this little box of additional features that we need to consider with regard to um, what it means to have no enhancement, what it means to have... Um, whether it's isolated as in there's no other metastatic disease and things like that. And it defines, you know, the terms such as, you know, washout and percent washout. Hi, this is Jim Chen. Over the next 50 minutes, we're going to do some neuroradiology case review. This is an airline worker with COVID-19. When we look at these images that I took from the literature, what we see is that there's an abnormality in the medial thalami bilaterally. And oftentimes when we think about medial thalamic abnormalities, we might be thinking about 
internal cerebral vein thrombosis and therefore bilateral thalamic venous infarcts, for instance. Other things that we might think about also could include artery of percheron infarcts with a single artery feeding both medial thalami, among other things. You can also think about toxic metabolic abnormalities as well. But in this particular case, what we see on this contrast enhanced CT is that the internal cerebral veins are widely patent. So there's no internal cerebral vein thrombosis. When we look at the MRI, what we see in this case is that there is an abnormality within the medial temporal lobes bilaterally associated with some areas of susceptibility. So we have some hemorrhage here as well, maybe some faint enhancement. But we also have these areas of incomplete ring enhancement or at least partial ring enhancement corresponding to the areas of abnormality in the thalami associated with some areas of mineral or hemorrhage with a fair amount of expansile edema here. In this particular case, this is a complication of COVID-19 associated with acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy. Although we're hopefully on the tail end or starting to get on the tail end of our COVID-19 pandemic, we must still be aware that there are some complications that can occur. Oftentimes we do see focal areas of ischemia or infarct, but we can also see this acute hemorrhagic necrotizing encephalopathy as well. Let's look at this next case. This is a patient with two and a half months of severe cramping dull pain in the back of neck. What we see is that there's a fluid signal cavity on T2, as well as stir within the cord itself, as well as what looks like a DEMA-like signal. That's a little bit expansive. And this seems to be centered in an area where the cord seems to be compressed by both disc, osteophyte, and ligamentum flavum. So the question is, is this myelomalacia? Is this edema? Is there an underlying lesion? So most of the time, this is going to be due to a compressive degenerative abnormality. And so oftentimes, the patient may get decompression if they're symptomatic, and then we'll re-image later to see how the patient is doing. But unfortunately, what we see after decompression is that despite the decompression, instead of having this small amount of cystic cavity with some adjacent edema-like signal, what we see is that the cord has now expanded and is actually bigger than it was uh, at any other level. So this seems expansile and a little bit scary, in fact. So because of that, the question of an underlying lesion Good morning, my name is Minnie Pathry and I'll be talking to you about trauma. We're gonna start first with the axial skeleton and then move on to the rest of the body. Now in terms of the spine, the most common locations where we're going to see injuries are going to be in the lower cervical spine and at the thoracolumbar junction. Injuries at the cranial cervical junction, upper thoracic spine and lower lumbar spine are less common but we'll cover those as well during this presentation. Let's start up at the top. On radiographs, one of the main features that we look for in injury is soft tissue swelling. And if you look at the normal soft tissues, we expect to see less than five millimeters anterior to the C2 body. And then things get less reliable in the lower cervical spine because of the presence of the arachnoids and the esophagus and the soft tissues can thicken up to two centimeters. So while this is a useful sign if it's present, unfortunately, it's not very sensitive. And with rapid response and trauma, it has actually low sensitivity for uh, fractures. And these days, conventional radiography is not the first line of imaging, but instead we use CT. And the nexus criteria for obtaining CT in patients with cervical injury are quite broad. They include distracting injuries, tenderness, any neurologic deficit, and also obtaining CT in patients who may not be able to give a reliable history or have a reliable physical examination. We're going to start at the very top, and I'll start with a very rare injury, which is cranial cervical dissociation. We don't usually see these patients because this injury is typically fatal at impact, and it results in the cranium uh, dissociating from the cervical spine and shifting anteriorly. There are several criteria that are described. The clival line passing anterior to the odontoid and powers ratio are used, as well as the presence of characteristic fractures involving the basion and the occipital uh, condyles, which would be better seen on a coronal plane. That's a rare 
trauma, this is a common trauma, and this is a blantoaxial instability. Here, the motion is between C1 and C2, and it takes place because of an incompetent transverse ligament, which may be incompetent from trauma or non-traumatic etiologies. The widening is most apparent when the spine is held in flexions. You can miss this injury when you're looking at somebody in a collar.